Lecture delivered by Swami Vivekananda at Los Angeles, California, January 8, 1900. Published by Advaita Ashrama, Publication House of Ramakrishna Mutt, Belur Mutt. All over the world, there has been the belief in the supernatural throughout the ages. All of us have heard of extraordinary happenings and many of us have had some personal experience of them. I would rather introduce the subject by telling you certain facts which have come within my own experience. I once heard of a man who, if anyone went to him with questions in his mind, would answer them immediately and I was also informed that he foretold events. I was curious and went to see him with a few friends. We each had something in our minds to ask and to avoid mistakes, we wrote down our questions and put them in our pockets. As soon as the man saw one of us, he repeated our questions and gave the answers to them. Then he wrote something on paper which he folded up asked me to sign on the back and said, Don't look at it, put it in your pocket and keep it there till I ask for it again. And so on to each one of us. He next told us about some events that would happen to us in the future. Then he said, Now think of a word or a sentence from any language you like. I thought of a long sentence from Sanskrit, a language of which he was entirely ignorant. Now take out the paper from your pocket, he said. The Sanskrit sentence was written there. He had written it an hour before with the remark, In confirmation of what I have written, this man will think of this sentence. It was correct. Another of us who had been given a similar paper, which he had signed and placed in his pocket, was also asked to think of a sentence. He thought of a sentence in Arabic, which it was still less possible for the man to know. It was some passage from the Quran, and my friend found this written down on the paper. Another of us was a physician. He thought of a sentence from a German medical book. It was written on his paper. Several days later, I went to this man again, thinking possibly I had been deluded somehow before. I took other friends and on this occasion also, he came out wonderfully triumphant. Another time, I was in the city of Hyderabad in India, and I was told of a Brahmin there who could produce numbers of things from where nobody knew. This man was in business there. He was a respectable gentleman, and I asked him to show me his tricks. It so happened that this man had a fever, and in India, there is a general belief that if a holy man puts his hand on a sick man, he would be well. This Brahmin came to me and said, Sir, put your hand on my head so that my fever may be cured. I said, Very good, but you show me your tricks. He promised. I put my hand on his head as desired and later he came to fulfill his promise. He had only a strip of cloth about his loins. We took off everything else from him. I had a blanket which I gave him to wrap around himself because it was cold and made him sit in a corner. Twenty-five pairs of eyes were looking at him and he said, Now look, write down anything you want. We all wrote down names of fruits that never grew in that country, bunches of grapes, oranges and so on and we gave him those bits of paper. And there came from under his blanket bushels of grapes, oranges and so forth, so much that if all that fruit was weighed, it would have been twice as heavy as the man. He asked us to eat the fruit. Some of us objected, thinking it was hypnotism. But the man began eating himself, so we all ate. It was all right. He ended by producing a mass of roses. Each flower was perfect with dew drops on the petals, not one crushed, not one injured, and masses of them. When I asked the man for an explanation, he said, it is all sleight of hand. Whatever it was, it seemed to be impossible that it could be sleight of hand merely, 
From whence could he have got such large quantities of things? Well, I saw many things like that. Going about India, you find hundreds of similar things in different places. These are in every country. Even in this country, you will find some such wonderful things. Of course, there is a great deal of fraud, no doubt. But then, whenever you see fraud, you have also to say that fraud is an imitation. There must be some truth somewhere that is being imitated. You cannot imitate nothing. Imitation must be of something substantially true. In very remote times in India, thousands of years ago, these facts used to happen even more than they do today. It seems to me that when a country becomes very thickly populated, psychical power deteriorates. Given a vast country thinly inhabited, there will perhaps be more of psychical power there. These facts, the Hindus, being analytically minded, took up and investigated. And they came to certain remarkable conclusions. That is, they made a science of it. They found out that all these, though extraordinary, are also natural. There is nothing supernatural. They are under laws just the same as any other physical phenomenon. It is not a freak of nature that a man is born with such powers. They can be systematically studied, practiced and acquired. This science they call the science of Raja Yoga. There are thousands of people who cultivate the study of this science and for the whole nation it has become a part of daily worship. The conclusion they have reached is that all these extraordinary powers are in the mind of man. This mind is a part of the universal mind. Each mind is connected with every other mind. And each mind, wherever it is located, is in actual communication with the whole world. Have you ever noticed the phenomenon that is called thought transference? A man here is thinking something and that thought is manifested in somebody else, in some other place. With preparations, not by chance, a man wants to send a thought to another mind at a distance. And this other mind knows that a thought is coming. And he receives it exactly as it is sent out. Distance makes no difference. The thought goes and reaches the other man and he understands it. If your mind were an isolated something here and my mind were an isolated something there and there were no connection between the two, how would it be possible for my thought to reach you? In the ordinary cases, it is not my thought that is reaching you direct, but my thought has got to be dissolved into ethereal vibrations and those ethereal vibrations go into your brain and they have to be resolved again into your own thoughts. Here is a dissolution of thought and there is a resolution of thought. It is a roundabout process, but in telepathy there is no such thing. It is direct. This shows that there is a continuity of mind as the yogis call it. The mind is universal. Your mind, my mind, all these little minds are fragments of that universal mind, little waves in the ocean. And on account of this continuity, we can convey our thoughts directly to one another. You can see what is happening all around us. The world is one of influence. Part of our energy is used up in the preservation of our own bodies. Beyond that, Every particle of our energy is day and night being used in influencing others. Our bodies, our virtues, our intellect and our spirituality. All these are continuously influencing others. And so conversely, we are being influenced by them. This is going on all around us. Now to take a concrete example, a man comes. You know he is very learned. His language is beautiful. And he speaks to you by the hour, but he does not make any impression. Another man comes and he speaks a few words, not well arranged, ungrammatical perhaps. All the same, he makes an immense impression. Many of you have seen that. So it is evident that words alone cannot always produce an impression. Words, even thoughts, contribute only one third of the influence in making an impression. The man, two thirds. What you call the personal magnetism of the man, that is what goes out and impresses you. In our families, there are the heads, 
Some of them are successful, others are not. Why? We complain of others in our failures. The moment I am unsuccessful, I say so and so is the cause of the failure. In failure, one does not like to confess one's own faults and weaknesses. Each person tries to hold himself faultless and lay the blame upon somebody or something else or even on bad luck. When heads of families fail, they should ask themselves why it is that some persons manage a family so well and others do not. Then you will find that the difference is owing to the man, his presence, his personality. Coming to great leaders of mankind, we always find that it was the personality of the man that counted. Now, take all the great authors of the past, the great thinkers, really speaking, how many thoughts have they thought? Take all the writings that have been left to us by the past leaders of mankind. Take each one of their books and appraise them. The real thoughts, new and genuine, that have been thought in this world up to this time amount to only a handful. Read in their books the thoughts they have left to us. The authors do not appear to be giants to us and yet we know that they were great giants in their days. What made them so? Not simply the thoughts they thought, neither the books they wrote, nor the speeches they made. It was something else that is now gone. That is their personality. As I have already remarked, the personality of the man is two-thirds, and his intellect, his words, are but one-third. It is the real man, the personality of the man, that runs through us. Our actions are but effects. Actions must come when the man is there. The effect is bound to follow the cause. The ideal of all education, all training, should be this man making. But instead of that, we are always trying to polish up the outside. What use in polishing up the outside when there is no inside? The end and aim of all training is to make the man grow. The man who influences, who throws his magic, as it were, upon his fellow beings, is a dynamo of power, and when that man is ready, he can do anything and everything he likes. That personality, put upon anything, will make it work. Now, we see that though this is a fact, no physical laws that we know of will explain this. How can we explain it? by chemical and physical knowledge? How much of oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, how many molecules in different positions, and how many cells, etc., etc., can explain this mysterious personality? And we still see it is a fact, and not only that, it is the real man, and it is that man that lives and moves and works. It is that man that influences, moves his fellow beings, and passes out and his intellect and books and works are but traces left behind. Think of this. Compare the great teachers of religion with the great philosophers. The philosophers scarcely influenced anybody's inner man, and yet they wrote most marvelous books. The religious teachers, on the other hand, moved countries in their lifetime. The difference was made by personality. In the philosopher, it is a faint personality that influences. In the great prophets, it is tremendous. In the former, we touch the intellect. In the latter, we touch life. In the one case, it is simply a chemical process, putting certain chemical ingredients together which may gradually combine and under proper circumstances bring out a flash of light or may fail. In the other, it is like a torch that goes round quickly, lighting others. The science of yoga claims that it has discovered the laws which develop this personality, and by proper attention to those laws and methods, each one can grow and strengthen his personality. This is one of the great practical things, and this is the secret of all education. This has a universal application. In the life of the householder, in the life of the poor, the rich, the man of business, the spiritual man, in everyone's life, it is a great thing 
the strengthening of this personality. There are laws very fine which are behind the physical laws as we know. That is to say, there are no such realities as a physical world, a mental world, a spiritual world. Whatever is, is one. Let us say it is a sort of tapering existence. The thickest part is here. It tapers and becomes finer and finer. The finest is what we call spirit. The grossest, the body. And just as it is here in microcosm, it is exactly the same in the macrocosm. The universe of ours is exactly like that. It is a gross external thickness and it tapers into something finer and finer until it becomes God. We also know that the greatest power is lodged in the fine, not in the coarse. We see a man take up a huge weight. We see his muscles swell and all over his body we see signs of exertion and we think the muscles are powerful things. But it is the thin thread-like things, the nerves, which bring power to the muscles. The moment one of these threads is cut off from reaching the muscles, they are not able to work at all. These tiny nerves bring the power from something still finer and that again, in its turn, brings it from something finer still, thought and so on. So, it is the fine that is really the seat of power. Of course, we can see the movements in the gross, but when fine movements take place, we cannot see them. When a gross thing moves, we catch it, and thus we naturally identify movement with things which are gross. But all the power is really in the fine. We do not see any movement in the fine, perhaps, because the movement is so intense that we cannot perceive it. But if by any signs, any investigation, we are helped to get hold of these finer forces, which are the cause of the expression, the expression itself will be under control. There is a little bubble coming from the bottom of a lake. We do not see it coming all the time. We see it only when it bursts on the surface. So we can perceive thoughts only after they develop a great deal or after they become actions. We constantly complain that we have no control over our actions, over our thoughts. But how can we have it if we can get control over the finer movements, if we can get hold of thought at the root, before it has become thought, before it has become action, then it would be possible for us to control the whole. Now, if there is a method by which we can analyze investigate, understand and finally grapple with those finer powers, the finer causes, then alone is it possible to have control over ourselves. And the man who has control over his own mind assuredly will have control over every other mind. That is why purity and morality have been always the object of religion. A pure moral man has control over himself. And all minds are the same, different parts of one mind. He who knows one lump of clay has known all the clay in the universe. He who knows and controls his own mind knows the secret of every mind and has power over every mind. Now, a good deal of our physical evil we can get rid of if we have control over the fine parts. A good many worries we can throw off if we have control over the fine movements. A good many failures can be averted if we have control over these fine powers. So far is utility, yet beyond there is something higher. Now I shall tell you a theory which I will not argue now but simply place before you the conclusion. Each man in his childhood runs through the stages through which his race has come up. Only the race took thousands of years to do it, while the child takes a few years. The child is first the old savage man, and he crushes a butterfly under his feet. The child is at first like the primitive ancestors of his race. As he grows, he passes through different stages, until he reaches the development of his race. Only he does it swiftly and quickly. Now, take the whole of humanity as a race. 
or take the whole of the animal creation, man and the lower animals, as one whole. There is an end towards which the whole is moving. Let us call it perfection. Some men and women are born who anticipate the whole progress of mankind. Instead of waiting and being reborn over and over again for ages until the whole human race has attained to that perfection, they, as it were, rush through them in a few short years of their life. And we know that we can hasten these processes if we be true to ourselves. If a number of men without any culture be left to live upon an island and are given barely enough food, clothing and shelter, they will gradually go on and on, evolving higher and higher stages of civilization. We know also that this growth can be hastened by additional means. We help the growth of trees, do we not? Left to nature, they would have grown, only they would have taken a longer time. We help them to grow in a shorter time than they would otherwise have taken. We are doing all the time the same thing, hastening the growth of things by artificial means. Why cannot we hasten the growth of man? We can do that as a race. Why are teachers sent to other countries? Because by these means we can hasten the growth of races. Now, can we not hasten the growth of individuals? We can. Can we put a limit to the hastening? We cannot say how much a man can grow in one life. You have no reason to say that this much a man can do and no more. Circumstances can hasten him wonderfully. Can there be any limit then till you come to perfection? So what comes of it? That a perfect man, that is to say, the type that is to come of this race, perhaps millions of years hence, that man can come today. And this is what the yogis say, that all great incarnations and prophets are such men, that they reached perfection in this one life. We have had such men at all periods of the world's history and at all times. Quite recently there was such a man who lived the life of the whole human race and reached the end even in this life. Even this hastening of the growth must be under laws. Suppose we can investigate these laws and understand their secrets and apply them to our own needs. It follows that we grow, we hasten our growth. We hasten our development and we become perfect even in this life. This is the higher part of our life and the science of the study of mind and its powers has this perfection as its real end. Helping others with money and other material things and teaching them how to go on smoothly in their daily life are mere details. The utility of the science is to bring out the perfect man and not let him wait and wait for ages, just a plaything in the hands of the physical world, like a log of driftwood carried from wave to wave and tossing about in the ocean. This science wants you to be strong, to take the work in your own hand, instead of leaving it in the hands of nature, and get beyond this little life. That is the great idea. Man is growing in knowledge, in power, in happiness. Continuously, we are growing as a race. We see that is true, perfectly true. Is it true of individuals? To a certain extent, yes. But yet, again comes the question, where do you fix the limit? I can see only at a distance of so many feet, but I have seen a man close his eyes and see what is happening in another room. If you say you do not believe it, perhaps in three weeks, that man can make you do the same. It can be taught to anybody. Some persons in five minutes even can be made to read what is happening in another man's mind. These facts can be demonstrated. Now, if these things are true, where can we put a limit? If a man can read what is happening in another's mind in the corner of this room, why not in the next room? Why not anywhere? We cannot say why not. We dare not say that it is not possible. We can only say, we do not know how it happens. Material scientists have no right to say that things like this are not possible. They can only say, we do not know. Science has to collect facts. 
generalize upon them deduce principles and state the truth that is all but if we begin by denying the facts how can a science be there is no end to the power a man can obtain this is the peculiarity of the indian mind that when anything interests it it gets absorbed in it and other things are neglected you know how many sciences had their origin in india mathematics began there you are even today counting 1 2 3 etc to 0 after sanskrit figures and you all know that algebra also originated in india and that gravitation was known to the indians thousands of years before newton was born you see the peculiarity at a certain period of indian history this one subject of man and his mind absorbed all their interests and it was so enticing because it seemed the easiest way to achieve their ends now the indian mind became so thoroughly persuaded that the mind could do anything and everything according to law that its powers became the great object of study charms magic and other powers and all that were nothing extraordinary but a regularly taught science just as the physical sciences they had taught before that such a conviction in these things came upon the race that physical sciences nearly died out it was the one thing that came before them different sects of yogis began to make all sorts of experiments some made experiments with light trying to find out how light of different colors produced changes in the body they wore a certain colored cloth lived under a certain color and ate certain colored foods all sorts of experiments were made in this way others made experiments in sound by stopping and unstopping their ears and still others experimented in the sense of smell and so on the whole idea was to get at the basis to reach the fine parts of the thing and some of them really showed most marvelous powers many of them were trying to float in the air or pass through it i shall tell you a story which i heard from a great scholar in the west it was told him by a governor of ceylon who saw the performance a girl was brought forward and seated cross legged upon a stool made of sticks crossed after she had been seated for a time the showman began to take out one after another these cross bars and when all were taken out the girl was left floating in the air the governor thought there was some trick so he drew his sword and violently passed it under the girl nothing was there now what was this it was not magic or something extraordinary that is a peculiarity no one in india would tell you that things like this do not exist to the hindu it is a matter of course you know what the hindus would often say when they have to fight their enemies oh one of our yogis will come and drive the whole lot out it is the extreme belief of the race what power is there in the hand or the sword the power is all in the spirit if this is true it is temptation enough for the mind to exert its highest but as with every other science it is very difficult to make any great achievement so also with this nay much more yet most people think that these powers can be easily gained how many are the years you take to make a fortune think of that first how many years do you take to learn electrical science or engineering and then you have to work all the rest of your life again most of the other sciences deal with things that do not move that are fixed you can analyze the chair the chair does not fly from you but this science deals with the mind which moves all the time the moment you want to study it it slips now the mind is in one mood the next moment perhaps it is different changing changing all the time in the midst of all this change it has to be studied understood grasped and controlled how much more difficult then is this science it requires rigorous training people ask me why i do not give them practical lessons why it is no joke i stand upon this platform talking to you and you go home and find no benefit 
nor do I. Then you say, it is all Bosch. It is because you wanted to make a Bosch of it. I know very little of the science, but the little that I gained, I worked for 30 years of my life. And for six years, I have been telling people the little that I know. It took me 30 years to learn it. 30 years of hard struggle. Sometimes I worked at it 20 hours during the 24. Sometimes I slept only one hour in the night. Sometimes I worked whole nights. Sometimes I lived in places where there was hardly a sound, hardly a breath. Sometimes I had to live in caves. Think of that. And yet I know little or nothing. I have barely touched the hem of the garment of the science. But I can understand that it is true and vast and wonderful. Now, if there is anyone amongst you who really wants to study the science, he will have to start with that sort of determination. The same as, nah, even more than that which he puts into any business of life. And what an amount of attention does business require? And what a rigorous taskmaster it is. Even if the father, the mother, the wife or the child dies, business cannot stop. Even if the heart is breaking, we still have to go to our place of business when every hour of work is a pang. That is business. And we think that it is just that it is right. This science calls for more application than any business can ever require. Many men can succeed in business. Very few in this because so much depends upon the particular constitution of the person studying it. As in business, all may not make a fortune, but everyone can make something. So in the study of the science, each one can get a glimpse which will convince him of its truth and of the fact that there have been men who realized it fully. This is the outline of the science. It stands upon its own feet and in its own light and challenges comparison with any other science. There have been charlatans, there have been magicians, there have been cheats, and more here than in any other field. Why? For the same reason that the more profitable the business, the greater the number of charlatans and cheats. But that is no reason why the business should not be good. And one thing more, it may be good intellectual gymnastics to listen to all the arguments and an intellectual satisfaction to hear of wonderful things. But if any one of you really wants to learn something beyond that, merely attending lectures will not do. That cannot be taught in lectures, for it is life. And life can only convey life. If there are any amongst you who are really determined to learn it, I shall be very glad to help them.